I'm Nancy, and I'd been looking forward to this weekend getaway for weeks. A rare chance to unplug from the daily grind and reset in a cozy rural escape. The listing photos showed a quaint little cottage tucked away in a sleepy village, surrounded by rolling fields and groves of twisted oak trees. Picturesque and isolated. Exactly what I needed to truly unwind. Marcus seemed normal enough when we exchanged messages to book the rental. A little over-friendly, maybe with his constant jokes and oversharing about his hobbies and life. But I chalked it up to him just being a classic people pleaser, the kind of lonely older guy who craves any human interaction he can get. The first hint of something being off was the way Marcus looked me over when I arrived, his roomy eyes lingering a beat too long on my body in a way that made my skin crawl. But he played it off as just being an attentive host, chattering away about the cottage's history and amenities as he showed me around. The bedroom is my personal favorite spot, he purred, running a hand along the plush duvet. With luxury bedding like this, you'll sleep like a lamb all snuggled up. The way he said it, coupled with the lecherous once-over, I felt sick to my stomach. I barely heard the rest of his commentary, just nodding along while willing him to finish up so I could have the place to myself. Finally, he took the hint and headed for the door with an over-exaggerated wink. If you need anything at all, dear, I'm just a holler away. Anything your heart desires, you just say the word. The second that door clicked shut behind him, I wanted to bolt. Every instinct was screaming at me to get out, to go literally anywhere else. But I pushed it down, convincing myself I was overreacting to harmless creepiness. I spent the next few hours anxiously puttering around the cottage, jumping at every creek and shadow, trying desperately to relax. I poured myself a glass of the complimentary wine and settled onto the plush couch, focusing on the gentle pops and crackles of the fireplace. As dusk fell, I finally started to unwind a little, lulled by the cozy ambiance. I even worked up the nerve to take a relaxing moonlight stroll around the property, breathing in the crisp night, air and admiring the primal darkness shrouding the slumbering woods and meadows. That's when I heard this sound, shattering the tranquil silence. My heart went into full panic mode as I rushed back inside, grabbing an ornamental poker from beside the fireplace and brandishing it defensively. Pulse pounding, I crept toward the source of the noise, and that's when I saw him. Marcus was crouched in the bedroom doorway, fully nude, grunting and rutting against the wooden floor like a feral animal. His mottled body glistened with sweat in the moonlight pooling through the window, face contorted in a snarling rictus as he rutted and humped at the floorboards. I wish I could purge the gurgled groan he made from my memory, a inhuman noise of pure animalistic depravity as his hips snapped forward one final time. His dead eyes finally focused on me, ignited with a frightening intensity as he slowly righted himself. I stood there paralyzed, bile burning in my throat as his softening member bobbed grotesquely. I don't know what would have happened if I stuck around to find out his intentions. Maybe he would have just slithered off into the night satisfied by his sick rutting ritual. But maybe, maybe that was just the start. All I knew was that I needed to get the hell out before I became another chapter in whatever deranged fantasy was unfolding. Clutching the poker like a lifeline, I turned and ran, hightailing it back to my car with shrieks of raw terror and the meaty slap of Marcus's footfalls in pursuit echoing through the night. I'll never forget the paralyzing panic I felt, fumbling with the keys as his guttural grunts closed in behind me. I waited until the very last second, he was nearly on top of me, before throwing the car in gear and flooring it. In the rear view I saw him silhouetted in the glare of my taillights, head whipping back and forth like a rabid beast as I peeled out in a spray of gravel. I broke nearly every traffic law in the books to put as much distance between me and that place as possible. I didn't stop driving until I'd made it all the way back to the safety of the city, pulling up to a friend's place wild-eyed and shaking like a leaf. I finally let out the screams that had been bottled up, harsh sobs, racking my body as I recounted every horrific detail. My friend held me and tried to rationalize it, insisting Marcus was clearly just a very disturbed man and that I got out before anything worse happened. He was just a creep, not an actual threat. You're safe now, but I'll never be able to fully unsee the primal darkness contorting Marcus's features, the cold deadness in his eyes as he shamelessly debased himself on that bedroom floor. Normal men don't do that. Normal creeps don't indulge urges that monstrous. 
What if my friend is wrong? What if fleeing only delayed the inevitable? I'm Ryan. I pulled up to the address and my stomach immediately dropped. The listing photos showed a charming little cottage surrounded by tall pines and flowering gardens. But in reality, it was just a rundown bungalow crammed between two dilapidated homes in a sketchy neighborhood. Overgrown weeds engulfed the sad patch of front yard, and most of the windows were boarded up with plywood. Still, I had already paid for the week through Airbnb, so I figured I'd make the best of it. Grabbing my duffel bag, I traipsed up the cracked front walkway and rang the doorbell. After a few minutes of silence, the door creaked open to reveal a young woman looking like she'd just rolled out of bed. You Ryan? She mumbled, squinting at me through puffy eyes. Her mousy brown hair was a tangled mess, and she was wearing an oversized Metallica t-shirt and tattered pajama pants. Uh, yeah. Nice to meet you. I trailed off, realizing she hadn't offered her name. I'm Tara, she said flatly before turning and shuffling back inside. I hesitated then stepped over the threshold, greeted by an intense wave of stale body odor and cigarette smoke. The living room was just as bleak as the exterior, with mismatched second-hand furniture clustered haphazardly around an ancient tube TV. The floors were sticky with spilled drinks, and the room was cluttered with overflowing ashtrays, empty beer cans, and piles of clothes. A faint humming sound came from the bare light bulbs dangling from the cracked ceiling on exposed wires. This way, Tara grunted, leading me down a narrow hallway to a small back bedroom. I couldn't help but notice the eerie lack of any personal items or decorations anywhere. No photos, no paintings, not even a tacky knickknack in sight, just blank, scuffed walls. The guest room was just as depressingly bare, with only a creaky metal bed frame, a nightstand and a flickering light humming loudly overhead. A solitary window looked out onto a patch of weeds and crumbling cinder blocks. Bathroom's right there, Tara muttered, gesturing vaguely down the hall before trudging away. As soon as she left, I collapsed onto the sagging mattress and let out a deep sigh. What had I gotten myself into? This place looked like a goddamn crack den. Part of me wanted to just cut my losses and leave. But where would I go? A few hours later, I decided to get some air and maybe just grab dinner and rethink my situation. I headed out, but when I returned around 8 p.m., the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Tara was sitting rigidly on the couch, bathed in the flickering glow of the TV, staring directly at the front door and not blinking. You're back, she stated in a toneless voice, not taking her eyes off me. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna hang in my room for the night. Get some work done, I replied nervously. She didn't respond, just kept staring, her expression utterly blank. Suppressing a shudder, I quickly made my way to the back bedroom and locked the door behind me. A few hours later, I was jolted awake by a loud crash and muffled shouting. I sat upright, my heart pounding, as I heard heavy footsteps stomping down the hallway. Suddenly, the door burst open with a splintering crack, and Tara came barreling inside, a look of unhinged fury on her face. You sick freak, she shrieked, grabbing a heavy ceramic lamp off the nightstand and raised it over her head. You had no right to go through my stuff. I threw my arms up in terror. What the hell are you talking about? I didn't touch anything. With an animalistic scream of rage, she wound up and bashed the lamp down towards my head. I managed to roll off the bed just in time the lamp shattering against the wall in a shower of glass and porcelain shards. Tara immediately dropped to her hands and knees, scooping up the jagged fragments and hurling them at me with terrifying force. I cowered on the floor, shielding my face as I was pelted from all angles, feeling warm blood trickle from fresh lacerations. You're a lying, perverted piece of shit, she howled, punctuating each word with another projectile assault. Nobody does that to me in my own house. Suddenly, a booming voice roared from the hallway. Tara, what the fuck is going on? I risked a glance over to see an absolutely massive man, easily six foot five and 300 pounds of pure muscle, standing in the doorway, chest heaving and face beat red with rage. Tara immediately froze like a deer in headlights. Lulu, I, I can explain, she stammered, 
frantically trying to straighten her hair with trembling hands. You better start talking real fast before I kick both your asses, the hulking man bellowed, his Brooklyn accent dripping with menace. I wake up to find my own goddamn house torn apart, blood everywhere. Fucking explain this shit. As Tara opened and closed her mouth soundlessly like a gasping fish, I took the opportunity to speak up. Look, man, there's been a crazy misunderstanding, I said, slowly standing up with my hands raised in surrender. A trickle of blood ran down my forehead from a gash above my eye. I booked this place through Airbnb for the week, but clearly your friend Tara has some major issues going on. I'll just grab my stuff and get out of here. Lou narrowed his eyes to slits, seeming to size me up as his chest swelled with anger. For a horrific moment, I thought he was going to charge at me like an enraged bull, but then he turned his withering glare towards the cowering Tara. You pulled that Airbnb scam again? He roared taking a menacing step forward. Tara shrank back with a pathetic whimper. How many times I gotta tell you that shit's gonna get us all killed? I didn't stick around to watch the ensuing blow-up between the psychotic couple. Seizing the moment, I grabbed my duffel bag and ran for the exit, half expecting to be struck by a stray bullet at any second. I threw myself into my car and peeled out, leaving nothing but a cloud of exhaust and burnt rubber in my wake. My heart was still pounding through my ribcage as I tore down the deserted city streets in the dead of night. I kept glancing in the rearview mirror, imagining that meathead maniac giving chase like a deranged Terminator, fueled by hardcore roids and pure bloodlust. Or worse, for that batshit crazy Tara to appear in my backseat like the grudge chick, her tangled hair hanging in her face and butcher knife in hand. It slowly sank in just how depraved how utterly unhinged those two must be to perpetrate that kind of deliberate sadistic Airbnb scam. What else were they capable of? I suppressed a shudder just thinking about all the horrors that could have gone down in that godforsaken place. All because of some tempting discount rate online. Safe in my apartment, looking over my shoulder constantly. At least now I truly understand. The only way to protect yourself from the depravity that festers in the sick minds of society's dregs is to never, ever let them through your door. You know that feeling you get when you think someone's watching you, but you can't quite put your finger on why? That was the vibe I got as soon as I walked through the door of the Airbnb beach cottage I had rented for my solo vacation. The place looked nice enough from the listing photos. A quaint two-bedroom place just a block from the ocean with a bright, sun-drenched living room and a kitchen stocked with all the basic amenities. Maybe it was just the fact that I was there alone without my boyfriend Matt that made me feel a bit on edge. This was supposed to be a relaxing reset for me before grad school started up again in the fall. I tried to shake it off as I settled in, telling myself I was being paranoid. The elderly owner, Judith, seemed perfectly sweet and friendly when she showed me around after I arrived. A diminutive woman in her seventies with a grandmotherly perm and pressed slacks. Hardly someone to be scared of, right? It wasn't until the next morning that the real creepy stuff started. I was making my usual avocado toast in the kitchen when I noticed something strange about the cutlery jar on the counter. The steak knives were all arranged in perfectly parallel lines instead of just jumbled together. Same with the forks and spoons, everything sat in weirdly meticulous organization. A bit compulsive for my tastes, but whatever, I thought with a shrug. To each their own. It was when I passed by the living room that a cold stickly fear seeped into my bones. The couch cushions were aligned just so in a borderline unnatural way, and the tasteful seascape painting on the wall was just slightly askew. A tiny, seemingly intentional imperfection that felt like it was mocking me. By lunchtime, I started noticing more and more of these weird little details that raised flags, like how all the bathroom towels were folded identically, with the same tightly compacted rectangles and nary a wrinkle in sight. Or the way the welcome basket of travel toiletries was arranged with such sterile, artificial precision. It was as if the place had been staged in an eerie, unsettling way that made my skin crawl. At first, I tried convincing myself that it was just the homeowner's intense cleanliness and organizational habits manifesting in an eccentric way. She did seem like a bit of an uptight neat freak when I met her, but there was something more insidious lurking underneath the surface. 
an orchestrated, calculated vibe that made me feel almost like I was being watched, studied. That's when I finally found the cameras. Two tiny pinhole lenses, both angled directly at the most private spaces. One was positioned in the vent on the ceiling of the bedroom, potentially capturing anyone, undressing or even being intimate on the bed. The other was nestled behind the towel rack in the bathroom, allowing a revolting view straight into the shower stall. I felt like I was going to vomit when I made those horrific discoveries. Tears of rage and revulsion stung my eyes as I frantically searched the rest of the cottage. This was no accident or mistake. The perfectly staged furnishings and decor, the subtle, unsettling details seeming to subliminally announce that I was being watched. It all made terrifying sense. That old lady was running an elaborately calculated spying operation, basically pimping out her cottage for legal voyeurism. I could only imagine the scores of people she had recorded over the years, their most private moments scrutinized and violated for someone's depraved entertainment. I barely remember fleeing the place, manically throwing my belongings into my bags as hysteria took over. Getting the hell out of there was my only thought as I tore out of the driveway, peeling towards the sanctity of the main road. I tried reporting it to the proper authorities, but who even knows if anything came of it? To this day, I can't quite shake the permanent sense of vulnerability and visceral violation from that experience. Was I bathing? Using the toilet? Undressing in front of those cameras without my knowledge? How many strangers scrutinized me through those predatory lenses like an animal in a zoo enclosure? I may never know. But what I do know is that I'll forever be paranoid about staying in any home or apartment that isn't my own safe haven. The inescapable fear that I'm being watched and preyed upon feels like a stain on my soul. All because some demented person decided to pervert the warm privacy of their home into a revolting peep show den. Thanks for that trauma, Judith. Your legacy is getting your kicks by haunting people's lives.